I recently traveled to UL Solutions in Northbrook, Illinois to see large-scale electric vehicle burns. And while I was down there, I had the chance to interview Adam Barrowy, research engineer with UL FSRI. Adam has a wealth of knowledge in the area of fire protection. With an engineering background, fire protection engineering background, volunteer firefighter at one point, he's done a lot of full-scale burns, not only with NIST, but also FSRI. And since 2016, he spent a lot of time working on batteries. He's worked on hoverboards, energy storage systems, and now electric vehicles. So let's get into some of the details of the project. Tell us a little bit about the background of the project. How long is the project going to last? Um, where are we at now? And kind of where's the future? This is a three-year project. And really, there's kind of an urgency to it because the world perceives EVs to be this sort of like already here an urgent hazard. And um, so we've produced some data on micromobility. We've produced some data on energy storage. Um, comparatively, the frequency of EV fires is not as great, but there right. is not much information on how EVs in North America burn. Um, there's not much scientific data, at least. And so we're funded for a three-year project. This is uh, just now getting into the second year. So our first year is mostly planning. Um, it's at about a million dollars a year. Okay. And so uh, we're basically here in the lab now doing phase one, which is a first series of experiments where we're just free burning vehicles. We're starting the fire in the battery, letting it run to completion. The, the second phase, which will begin at the end of this year, we'll take a look at what happened with the vehicles, take a look at the construction, and then start doing suppression experiments to look at what's the effectiveness of, uh, of standard firefighting appliances on those vehicles. What enables us to do all of this work is money from the UL Enterprise. So there was an endowment that came when originally UL, one company, split into a for-profit, not-for-profit of about $2 billion. Okay. So that endowment allows us to fund the research to be unbiased, so we're not taking money from any manufacturers. The cars that you're going to see uh, in this test series, we purchased all of them um, through, uh, through a used dealer local to here. Okay, so no manufacturer money, no government money, it's all internally funded. Yep. Which I know that was a big question on my first video. A lot of yeah. people thought the government was throwing money at this. We've, we have a long history of doing Department of Homeland Security grants, and that's what really helped to build the Fire Safety Research Institute. So those have been extremely important. But with this change in the UL enterprise, that's what lets us detach from that. Some of the things we're looking to learn from this project... Yep. Um, you know, I, I know some of it's on the exposure side, some of it's on the firefighting side. So let's talk a little bit, I guess, on the exposure. There's a, there's a big concern right now about gear contamination, mm -hmm. about exposure to firefighters when they're around these vehicles. Um, so what are we looking at? Well, what's, what's interesting about this is uh, we have experience, the fire services experience um, with how internal combustion engine vehicles burn, right? You used to get your first-hand experience. Right. But surprisingly, there's actually not a lot of research data on full-scale burns like we're doing here yep. and occupational exposures with that. So there's a little bit of data internationally, look, and it looks at things like PAHs, PFOS, and VOCs. But we haven't taken a good look at how internal combustion engine carbs burn in about 20, 30 years. So we don't have much to compare it to. So we actually, in this project, have to do, we have to burn both um, so that we have a baseline to say, well, we can't know what's different with EVs until we have some data from internal combustion engine cars. Right. So we burned one so far, um, which you saw last December. Now what we're doing for occupational exposure hazard monitoring, yeah, we're looking at what ends up on swatches of turnout gear. Um, and then we have a broad approach and a targeted approach. What I mean by that is, we are capturing air samples during the testing. Those go off for gas chromatography. So we can look at everything that was in that air sample. Um, so it's really broad. So if we don't know what we're looking for, that helps us kind of narrow it down. There are other things that are always of concern for structure fires, training fires, things like that. We have some history with um, con contamination on instructors, like in flashover trailers. Right. So we look at some of those same things, benzene, uh, formaldehyde, again, PFOS, PAHs, and all that. So we know to do that. And then 
We're also here working with uh, some researchers from NIOSH who are taking a look at what ends up on the turnout gear swatches and also, frankly, what just lands on horizontal surfaces. So they get these cookie sheets and they do swipe tests. So the idea is to understand what's in the air, what's in the particulate, and we're also doing some measurements directly in the plume to see what's coming off the car because there's obviously a lot of concern with what could be in the plume going downwind and affecting, you know, people exposed to smoke. Well, from what I've seen, at least from the experiments we, we've done so far, is the biggest thing when you look at these vehicle fires is the plastics. There's so much plastic in any vehicle that it's just, it's off, it, all this sooty black smoke is coming off. And, and I think, you know, we won't know until we have the data, but sure. it feels like that's more a hazard at this point than anything else. Casually, you can look at vehicle construction and say the vehicles for today have more plastic than the vehicles 10 years, 20 years, 30 years ago. It's a trend. Right. And it gives us a vehicle performance that as consumers, you know, we like it. They, you, your vehicles are lighter, they're faster, they're higher performance, they're more comfortable. Um, but switching to plastics means more fuel. Yeah. And so that's been driving the speed the fire grows. Um, I mean, that's sort of what the international and some of our preliminary data says. Um, the peak of the fire could be bigger. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the cabin fire can be pretty severe. Right. And, you know, talking about the fire size, there's also this misconception that an EV fire is, you know, 5,000, 10,000 degrees. The, the, the heat of the sun is coming off this EV. Yep. I mean, realistically, what's the difference? Are you seeing much of a difference? Um, it's, it's hard to say right now. I mean, some of this data, so the, these walls that we have on either side of the car are to help us understand that. So there's, there's particular concern. I mean, hotter could be true in that jet that you, you know, if you've seen battery fires, you see that jet coming out, it's brighter, right? Typically that sort of correlates with temperature, but that's not really the thing that matters. I mean, as engineers, we look at heat flux and that's what these panels do. So that's how much energy gets delivered to something that's combustible. And what, what we're able to do is say, well, clearly the majority, cause the flames are all coming out of the cabin and, and all driven by those plastics. Right. Most of the exposure is coming from that. But as those jets come out, are we seeing them add meaningfully to the exposure hazard? So far, we haven't, just with the cars we burn, we haven't seen much jetting. We know that'll probably show up with other cars, but we're able to look at it and then either by hand calculations or by some computer models say, what if we had a car six feet away, 12 feet away, what if this parked in a driveway and you're exposing the vinyl siding of a house? All this data is so we can look at that and say, are EVs burning different? Do the jets matter? Is it different in a way where the hazard is increased from uh, internal combustion engines? Yeah. Right. And I think that's a, a thing most people don't understand is heat flux. You know, you can have a, a constant temperature in two different situations. And the heat flux is basically the amount of energy that's delivered, correct? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So heat flux is what's going to determine temperature rise. So if you had a block of wood and you have some heat flux to it, it's going to eventually end up at one constant temperature. If you double the heat flux, then the temperature is going to come up, not, not necessarily double, but the temperature is going to come up. So heat flux is an important tool. It's kind of a fundamental measurement for us to be able to take, say, those computer models and say, well, I've got plastic or wood uh, and understand how much that's going to heat up based on those materials properties, as well as depending on uh, you know, how much flux it takes for ignition, when they might ignite. Next steps after we burn through all these vehicles, lots of data analysis, I imagine. Mm -hmm. um, kind of what's the time frame you think between the conclusion of these tests and, and getting all the, the data analyzed? So we, it's, it's actually kind of imperative for us to stay on the schedule of the project that we've got to deliver uh, a published report we're targeting quarter three of this year. Okay. Uh, so what we need to be able to do is take this data, video, everything we learn, photos of the damage of the car after, review it completely to understand how the vehicles burn, go through that with our technical panel and say, given the similarities and the differences of these cars and what we see in a let it burn scenario, what, is, what are the least common denominators? I think we could develop suppression tactics that are specific to every single car but that's not going to help the fire service a whole lot. Right. We need some generalized approaches, and that's, that's our goal. I mean, the data, we don't have it yet. We have to go through it to get to that point. But 
Um, yeah, so we need to basically target this fall for a report. For that, we'll go through with a tech panel, review it, confirm what we saw, and then start developing, okay, well, if some of these vehicles are built this way and some of these other vehicles are built this other way, can we take advantage of some of it? Like, right. Um, I know some vehicles may have access ports for getting water inside the battery. Some are by design, some may burn a hole open. Can we take advantage of that? Um, there are specialized tools, but it, it'll be hard to make a recommendation to use those specialized tools if we don't have the experience of knowing what every fire truck carries. So will that work? Right. And unfortunately, every fire truck carries water and a nozzle, and that's yep. what we're used to using. So yep. uh, there's a lot of different tools being sold to solve this problem, and it's hard to say if any one tool is going to be effective. So yep. kind of next steps after the report, come back here, burn more vehicles, and try to extinguish them. Is yeah. And yeah, I mean, we'll look at what limits, uh, what, what kind of impedes fire extinguishment. I think we'll have a pretty good sense of, you know, what can be more successful than maybe just spray water from underneath. I mean, I think it, it's logical. It's, it's a good idea to have tried to start there, but we're going to really see maybe angles of attack that, that you wouldn't see on an incident because we have all, you know, we've got months to look through all the sensor instrumentation uh, data and then also all of the camera angles and we can kind of go through and figure out where can we get a purchase point that you're not going to have time in an incident to, to be able to do that kind of analysis. Right. And one thing I didn't cover yet, but there's a ton of people working on this project. Do you have a, a number on how many are actually involved in this? Well, yeah, so there are 17 people on the tech panel. Um, so just, just to mention that quickly, I mean, it's so it's fire service, uh, vehicle fire investigators, vehicle crash investigators. Um, now, we've taken no, you know, benefit from the manufacturers other than we have uh, Ford, Tesla, and GM aboard to help us understand what we're seeing with the vehicles. Uh, right. So they're, they're valuable in contributing their opinion and understanding the vehicle construction. And then, yeah, on, on our technical team, we have a team from the Large Scale Fire Laboratory in Northbrook. Um, it's about seven staff. Uh, there's about six staff from FSRI involved full time. We've kind of some people coming and going, but uh, we've pulled staff from Hawaii, uh, Oregon, Illinois, Maryland. So it's it's all of our specialists kind of from all, all over, each sort of taking a major role in the project, looking at heat flux or gas species or occupational exposure hazard measurements. Uh, we also have some staff here from NIOSH uh, helping us with the occupational exposure hazards. And that's that's kind of just everyone that's here. Of course, this has generated a ton of interest. And so right. we're talking and sort of sharing information as we go with other other fire departments, other government organizations, other research organizations internationally, um, RISE in Sweden, uh, DBI in Denmark. So it's really, uh, this is a concern globally. And so it's just pull people from all over. It's, it is amazing. Yeah, it's it really is incredible. And seeing everybody work and everybody has their own it almost like every single person involved has their own research project just you know very small chunks oh yeah and yeah a bunch of <laughs> bunch of pieces put together for for this so i mean uh, even just to do the measurement of fire size so we've got the car sitting on this platform that was a six-month engineering project to put this whole system together that can uh right so it's got about a 12 or thirteen thousand uh pound measurement capacity but it, it's got a resolution of a tenth of a pound, so we could throw a tape measure in the car and see it show up. But that, that level of precision is what we need to know how fast the car is burning. So as it loses weight from all that stuff burning off, we can see that. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the, the big wall panels there, same deal. I mean, that seemed like a, a massive undertaking to, to understand that and calibrate it and really be able to get real, even down to the paint. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's years of research um, by one of our researchers, Matt DiDemizio. It was part of the research that got him his uh, PhD. And last year, about this time, he'd run experiments for the National Institute of Justice looking to use that to better understand burn patterns on walls uh, and how heat flux drives burn patterns and how we can use computer models potentially to recreate those burn patterns or, or not. And so it's kind of a validation study. So those were, he was burning upholstered chairs and using gas burners and doing spill fires. Uh, so in the span of a year, he's 
validated it, shown that the measurements are accurate, and scaled it up to the point where now we can look at cars. But uh, right. it is cutting edge stuff, absolutely. Yeah, there's a ton of stuff like that here. I do appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk to me today. Yeah. Um, look forward to working through and, and seeing the rest of these vehicles burn. Yeah. Um, we, we're going to do this Ionic here uh, tomorrow and then um, the Tesla, the Model 3 on Thursday. Yep. So, and unfortunately, I can't be here next week, mm -hmm. but uh, two more vehicles next week. So, absolutely. A lot of great stuff. We're getting a lot of, a lot of good data and looking forward to seeing the results. Absolutely. Never a dull moment. So, looking yeah. forward to the burns too.